Anyway, we just got finished singing a lot of songs, songs that were written by someone who was really enamored by the act of God bringing Christ to us through the form of the birth that came the way it did. And we can sing those songs and sometimes we can think, well, they're a little slow. Why is this thing ringing? Something's ringing. I don't like it. We can think they're a little slow and they're a little maybe old-fashioned. But if you actually get into the spirit of the song, the spirit that the writer was in when he was writing, the spirit of the message, the Holy Spirit already begins to flow. And the other thing is, if you, if you think about the, the, the background and the backdrop of what, what culture was like and what the world was like at the time that these ev- events happened, you get a whole different picture too. And so I don't just plow into a Christmas message starting with the angel coming to Mary and saying it's going to happen. I look back a little further and I look at some different things that were in place and things that were coming so that we can appreciate the bursting forth of the angels, the passion that they had, the power that came with them when they came to the earth, and the message that actually arose in the hearts of the people that believed. It's powerful. It's powerful beyond, it's almost powerful beyond description, and yet you can grasp it if you really get into it. And so, so in order to start this, I've got to go all the way back to creation. And what I did is I went and, and picked out a lot of the Bible verse prophecies that talk about the, uh, hey, stop it, I need you guys. <laughs> that talk about the comings of Christ and the situations that the world was in at the time. We understand quite well the, the um, story of Adam and Eve in the garden, the fall of man. They fell into sin and the fall of man there. And right there in the Garden of Eden, a promise was given to Adam and Eve that, that yes, they had sinned, but a deliverer was going to come. Someone was going to come that was going to bring victory to what had just happened. And it was given in very vague terms. In a sense, it was given in, in ways they could barely understand and yet grasp it for real because the prophecy was given to them that their seed would rise up and uh, crush, so to speak, crush or bruise the head of the serpent. That made sense to Adam and Eve. The serpent just deceived her. But their children were going to rise up and crush that thing out. And they interpreted that as a, as a deliverer coming. And they kept preaching that for, for years and for generations to come. But instead of Instead of seeing a fulfillment of that immediately, they went through a long, hard process. As a matter of fact, the next, the, the, the next thing that happened for Adam and Eve was Cain was born. The next big event, Cain was born. And right away they thought, yes, this is, this is the man. This is the redeemer. This is the promised one. This is the one that's going to redeem back what we lost. What did Cain become? A murderer. Vastly different what, than what they, what they realized or what they thought it would be. And so we went through that whole course of, of history for about 2,000 years where there was a remnant of people who believed the promises of God and were looking for it. And yet vast multitudes turned their backs on God and went their own way. And they continued in that all the way up through until, until Genesis 22, 18 is, is where we see again where that promise is renewed. And that is when God called Abraham out. Abraham was called out of a pagan nation, out of the sin and idolatry, out of a place where God could not abide. Abraham was called out of it so this promise could be renewed. And God, gave, God called him out and then established him as a, as a wandering promise believer, so to speak. Gave him a promise of the promised son, God tested his obedience by asking him to offer up his son. And after he passed the test, here in verse 17 and 18, starting in verse 16, God said, By myself I have sworn, saith the Lord, for because that thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld, withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and thy, sel- thy seed in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. That's where the promise was once again renewed and kind of brought back to life. On into Numbers 
24, verse 17 up to 19. And, and from these prophecies, from the remnant that kept following God and kept believing His promise, from these prophecies, they got a picture of an, of, of an earthly government being established by their descendants. So if you keep that in mind as we go through these prophecies, you'll see it again and again and again. An earthly government in their mind is what was being established. Here in Numbers 24, verse 7, God spoke here. And he said, he hath, he hath said, which heard the, voice of, heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the visions of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having mine eyes open. This was Balaam when he was called to curse the children of Israel as they were going through the wilderness journey. And Balaam seemed to be, I can't quite describe Balaam. In one, in one sense, he seemed to be a prophet of Baal, and yet in another sense, he heard the voice of God. So I don't really know exactly who he was. But in this case, he could not curse the children of Israel. And this was Balaam prophesying about the children of Israel when he blessed them. This is what happened when he was up on that mountain supposed to curse them. This is what happened. He heard the, voice of, he heard the words of God and he knew the knowledge of the Most High. He saw the vision of the Almighty and falling into a trance... He had his eyes open. There he was. And it's like the Spirit of God came on him so strong that he could not but bless. And this is what he said. I shall see him, but not now. They were in bondage at the time. I shall behold him, but not nigh. It's, you mean not in a couple years from now. But there shall come a star out of Jacob, and his scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the, destroy all the children of Seth. And Edom shall be a possession. Sarah also shall be a possession for his enemies and Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. So if you look at that from where they were at at that point, it looked like they were going to establish an earthly reign. And so they kept believing that for years, generations. Now going to 2 Samuel 7, 12 and 13. Here... God is establishing David, the second king of Israel. The first king of Israel was Saul. He, he, he was wayward, and he fell off of the ways of God toward the end of his reign. David was established as a man after God's own heart, having a, a passion and a zeal for God. And so God was able to bring to him a vision or a prophecy or a, a hope, a beacon of hope of what would happen. And he's, he's giving a blessing to David. And in verse 12, he's saying to him, And when thy days, being thy days as king, shall be fulfilled, and you shall sleep with your fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed forth from thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for thy name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And so again, you're, they were seeing the establishment of an earthly kingdom because it was, the word was given to a king. And it was spoken to a congregation of people repeatedly. The only check here that they could have had is that this is an establishment forever. Now, I don't know what they believed about the earth at the time. We as a congregation or we as believers don't believe that this earth is going to stay established in its current state forever. I don't know if they did or if they didn't. But if they didn't believe that the earth was going to stand perpetually, then they had to see that this forever was different than an earthly kingdom. I think part of what they believed is that ongoingly, the, the, the kings of Israel were to be in the descending family of David, which that was what it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be in that lineage and in that order, following, flowing down through the years. Now let's go to Psalms 72, 1 to 13. Here is, again, this is about David. And he's, he is giving the word to his son Solomon. And yet it's at the same time as he's speaking to his son as, as king, it is also a prophecy concerning the Messiah. And so in verse 1 he starts, Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge the people with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. The mountains shall bring peace to the people and the little hills but righteousness. 
He shall judge the poor of the people and shall save the children of the needy and shall break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the moon grass and as the showers that water the earth. In his days shall the righteous flourish in the abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from river from the river that ends unto the ends of the earth. And they that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him and his enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and the isles shall bring presents and the kings of Sheba, kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all the kings shall fall down before him and all nations shall serve him. For he will deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also and him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor and the needy and shall save the souls of the needy. So I believe that Solomon in, in, in his growing and expanding kingdom was able to do this. But also it was a prophecy concerning the Messiah, Jesus Christ, what he would do. Psalm 72. And so now go to Isaiah, if you want to follow after Isaiah 1, verse 1. And they kept, the, the prophets kept hearing from God details about what was supposed to happen so they could keep their focus on the promise and their hope stayed alive. We need the same thing today. We, we, need, we need the Word of God, the Holy Spirit of God, the saints of the people around us, preachers of our day to keep speaking God's revelation, both His revealed Word and His rhema spoken Word to us, so that the promises that we believe and so that the things and the visions that God gives us, they can actually stay alive. And so that you can stay filled with hope. If these promises and the word of God that we know, if these things, if they don't stay alive, basically we, if, we, if we turn away from them or stop pressing in for them and no fresh revelation is given to us, that is a recipe for hopelessness. And so that is why we need to keep just like these, just like through the whole, the whole Old Testament, God kept raising up prophets, and usually in dark times. Dark times of bondage and oppression, and when sin was rampant in the land, wicked kings were in place, and the remnant, the people of God, the people that believed God, said, where is? Where is the hope? Where is the Redeemer? And they kept believing, and they kept looking. And when they cried out, even just a small amount of the people, cried out to God, where is this promise? Where is the hope of it? God would send a prophet and he would speak and the hope and the vision stayed alive. Here was Isaiah. He came and gave a little more specific direction. Isaiah 11, verse 1 to... We'll probably read down about verse 5. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, and the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he shall make him quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. If you were a godly person, in that day, or even today yet, when you're a godly people and you're, a, you're in a nation or in, a, in amongst a, a corrupt system of politics or religion or whatever, and this sin is oppressing you, we need to hear that promise refreshed. What better word than this, the prophet saying, He, when He comes, the promised Redeemer, He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. We would go, yeah, finally, where is he? And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. They wanted that. They wanted someone who had righteousness for his standard of operation. They didn't want that corrupt system that, that was all around them. Faithfulness, the girdle of his reins. He's, he, he, would, he would control, he would, he would supply or control or the flow of a king was, 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 it was like the reins. They could do whatever they wanted. The reins of a horse, they could, they could drive like mad and just be ruthless. Or they could be gentle, be empowering, fulfilling the people's needs. 
And that's what they saw in this prophecy. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Jeremiah. 23, verse 5 and 6. Behold, the day shall come, saith the Lord, that I will raise up unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. And in his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell in safety. And this is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Can you see by these words that these prophets were giving that they clearly understood that this was going to be an earthly reign? Very clear. No wonder, it's no wonder that when Jesus came, when he did, that most of the people missed it. But the reality of it was, is the remnant, the ones who were truly the children of God, the ones who pressed in for the reality of God to be revealed, they understood spiritually like we must. They understood spiritually. Yes, yes, there was going to be a change in the land, but they understood that this was a deliverer from their sin problem, not just a deliverer from their bondage in their land. Daniel finally gets a prophecy. Daniel gets a prophecy in chapter 9, verse 24. Now look where Daniel was at. They had just been, they had just been drawn out of Jerusalem. They had the, the 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 opposing nations around them had just come, destroyed their city, destroyed their temple, defiled their temple, literally laid to ruin everything that they had hoped for, worked for, and lived for. Taken a small amount of the people captive. Most of the other people had been destroyed with the edge of the sword. A little bit of people actually stayed living in Jerusalem in, in the ruins thereof. Took, took the, what they called the best of the people into captivity. And there, in that captivity, in that place, Daniel got this prophecy. He was, he was pressing in for his people. He was pressing in for deliverance. He was repenting for his people. It's in chapter 9 here where Daniel prays for his people and goes into that, that long fast in pressing in for a breakthrough for his people. And, and a messenger, an angel, was, was, was sent by God to come and give Daniel this message, but he was held back for 21 days by the messenger of Satan or, the, or another angel. Finally, the angel broke through, and he brought this message to Daniel. Verse 23, At the beginning of thy supplications the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved, and therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. Seventy weeks are determined upon the people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, threescore and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times." And then it goes on to talk about after three score and two weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, not for himself, but the people shall... So basically what was given to Daniel in this place and in this time of bondage and darkness, if you interpret what the angel gave to him, it was an interpretation of 450 years until this Messiah comes. Would you feel like jumping up and down? If your city was lying in ruins, your place of what you considered holiness where you met the Most High... God, where you got revelation, where you got fed, where you went for to sacrifice a lamb for forgiveness of your sins, all that was wiped out and destroyed. And you were still believing in a Redeemer to come to redeem you and take you out of bondage and set you as a nation on high and cause you to flourish. And a prophet came and said, 450 years yet! Wouldn't you tend to get discouraged? Yeah, you would. You would, 450 years yet. And yet, there was always a remnant, a group of people that hung on to. Not only the future vision, but they walked in the Spirit of God and in the Word that they understood, and they walked in what they knew was righteous. 
day by day and step by step, therefore not losing hope. 450 years, you would have to realize in this day and age, they were no longer living to be 960 or 875 or the, they were maxed out at about 120, about like we are now. Now, that's about how long they lived in, this, in Daniel when he got this prophecy. So anyone that was living at that time knew that he was going to die and not see the prophecy fulfilled with his own eyes and in his own time. And so they had no choice but to go back and to walk by faith in this day and in what I know now. And that's how we've got to live too. There are still prophecies unfolding in front of us. There's sometimes people rise up and said that Christ's second coming is right around the corner. As a matter of fact, it's going to come on such and such date. People who followed those prophecies and sold themselves out to it, when the date came, nothing happened. Those people went home bitter, depressed, upset. The groups shattered. Don't follow those prophecies. Follow the true ones. And so, the remnant that kept pressing in, going with what they knew, and having reserved unto themselves the fact that maybe I won't see the fulfillment of this promise with my own eyes and in this lifetime, I will still be faithful to God. We have to do the same thing. God has given us many prophecies, promises meaning. Some of them are right in His Word and they apply to our daily lives. Some of them are individually. It's a promise for you. God promised you something that doesn't pertain to me. Or He promised, we have different promises that God gives to us. If we continue to walk in faith, believing that those promises will be fulfilled somehow, that keeps hope alive. 450 years. Mika. Micah. M-I-C-H-A. Chapter 5, verse 2. Now, he had given a time and he had given a lineage of exactly which family it was supposed to come out of years before. Now this prophet comes along and he says, where? In verse 1 he says, Now gather thyself together in troops, O daughters of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, thou, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth. Unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from old and from everlasting. Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. They were acknowledging a small group of people that were pressing in for the promises. And here he's saying where it's going to happen. Out of the lowliest little town that they could basically had in their midst, in their around them there. And then in Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 9, verse 9, It's a very clear one as to why they would begin to believe that this is governmental. Isaiah 9 verse 6. For unto, oh, stop. Before I even start reading that, just before that he talks about the battle. The people walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the shadow of death Upon them hath the light shined. So they were in a very dark situation at the time of this prophecy. And the prophet is going through and talking about this. Verse 5, it says, For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and his garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. Again, he gives this, he, he, he's painting the picture of the nation, exactly what was happening at the time. And then it seems like he flips right into something completely else, but it's hope. Verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. 
upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forever and ever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So now let's go to Luke 2. So through these prophecies and God calling upon the prophets or the prophets calling upon God and God hearing them, coming and giving them a word is how the prophecy or the hope stayed alive. And what was interesting is there's, there's only a, f- a few people who, who followed it close enough to understand it. And it was to those few people that things actually began to happen when the time, when the appointed time was fulfilled. The first, okay, so from the last prophet, the last prophet that came and brought hope to to the children of Israel, from then until Zechariah gets a word in the, when he's ministering to the Lord in the temple, from the last prophet to Zechariah, there were 400 years of no prophets. 400 years of no word from the Lord. 400 years of some of the most unthinkable bondages and wickedness, idol worship, and all kinds of horrible stuff happening in the land of Israel. 400 years of darkness. The the remnant, the the, the remaining people that were still believing in the promise of a deliverer from both the oppression of the land and from this sin that so oppressed them was getting... they They were pressed. They were... It was like hope was almost gone. And so in Luke 1, we start reading about the, the angel comes to Zechariah. And I'm not going to read all that. I'm just going to talk about it a little bit. So Zechariah was, he, he was priest at the time. So he was in the temple performing the duties of a high priest, which was ministering to the Lord and sacrificing for the people. And that. it was while he was in there, in the presence of God, that an angel came and spoke to him and said that not only... Not only did he promise them a son, him and his wife didn't have any children, and that was a great burden for anyone at that time in that culture. And not only did, this, did the angel come and promise them a son, but he said, this, this baby that shall be born, his name shall be John, and he shall have a special mission. His mission is to be a forerunner of the Messiah. Now you talk about hope coming alive. This baby, which is going to be born... First of all, the baby is going to be a miracle, and he is a forerunner of the Deliverer, the Messiah, the one you've been waiting for. He had a challenge believing this, and so he was smote with, he was deaf until the child was born. But he went home and he told his wife, and she believed it, and the baby was conceived. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God. Now I'm reading in uh, Luke. 1 verse 25 or 26. The angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin that was engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. Now, Mary was obviously one of the remnant. She was one that still believed the promises of God. And in that group of people that kept this promise alive, that believed in it, I am sure because of how we know that women talk and girls share and talk about things, that, the, that somewhere along the line they talk about who will be the mother of this deliverer, this redeemer. They knew which family line it was in. And so my, my theory is that they talked about this. Young girls talked about this. I think those Jewish girls at the ages 14, 15, and 16 were way more mature than some of our teenagers of today. They talked about things that were real. And so they probably used to talk about, do you think it's you? What about that? Do you know that girl over there? She is so sweet. I could just see her being the mother of the Messiah. Maybe some felt unworthy. But I'm sure that they talked about it. And so here comes an angel comes to a young girl. She was engaged to a man whose name was Joseph. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw the angel, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of greeting this would be. But the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. 
He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. She knew when she heard those words who this was. This was the Messiah. They understood these scriptures. And angel said, Mary said to the angel, how is this going to happen? I don't know a man. And the angel said and said, answered and said to her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And then, then the angel goes on and tells her right on the spot right there that her cousin Elizabeth has conceived, and it's, she's six months on. So Mary rose, and she was all excited about this, and she went over to Elizabeth's house. And when they greeted, when Mary greeted Elizabeth, it came to pass, verse 41, that when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, that the babe leaped in her womb, which was John the Baptist. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, and she spake with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou, Mary, among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord? See, they understood who they were carrying. They understood what was happening. Whence is this that the mother of my Lord, my, de my Redeemer, my Deliverer should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy greeting sounded in my ears, my babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she that believeth, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. So there was no question about who they were carrying or what was going to happen. They understood because they were, they were holy people. They were righteous people who kept to the promises of God, studied the scriptures, and knew them at least enough that when things began to unfold and the rhema word, what was happening here, we can read now. They couldn't read this. But when they started experiencing it, they were like, yes, this is it. And we are in the same position for other things. There's prophecies that have been prophesied over us, over the world, over the end times and whatever. And we can read in the book of Revelation. We can read in the, in the book of Daniel and Zechariah. Read in these different places. And in part kind of wrap our minds around it. But we don't quite fully grasp it. Believers even disagree. No, it's not going to be that way. It's going to be this way. No, no, no. That can't. This has to be this way. There's a disagreement about some of these studies of end times. But let me tell you. Those who walk in such a way that they hear the Spirit of God. When things begin to happen, we will receive knowledge of the Spirit and say, Oh, this is what it is. This is it. That is how you stay on track. That's how these people stayed on track. And then there's awesome prophecies that they exchange with each other. When John the Baptist gets born, his dad prophesies majorly over this John the Baptist and what he's going to do and, and those things. And then Mary goes back home. When she was back home, she wasn't much more than home. Um, soon after that, there was a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world should be taxed. They had to be counted and taxed, and they had to go back to where they were born. So Joseph and Mary had to travel back to Bethlehem, which is why they even ended up there at this time. They didn't live there. And verse 7 in Luke 2. Verse 6, and so it was that while they were there in Bethlehem, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in that same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. But the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, for unto you... Born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel, one angel that came and told him, with him suddenly there was a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill to men. From the time of creation, approximately 4,000 years before this, until this moment, there was no such, there was no event that was anywhere as close, as glorious or exciting as this one. Okay, first of all, picture who angels are. Angels are created beings created by God to worship Him and do His bidding. Sent to the saints and the believers as ministering spirits. 
when you pray, when we pray, when the Old Testament saints had, saints had been praying, many of those angels were given commandments, go take care of this. Here's a need. Many times you can read that Daniel was praying, pressing in, seriously pressing in for 21 days, and the angel that was given a commandment by God to go minister to Daniel and give him the vision was held back by a demon of darkness for 21 days. But the angel broke through and brought the message. How many other thousands of angels, thousands of stories like that that are not written were happening in the angelic host? They too were excited about this breakthrough, about the Redeemer, the accomplishment thereof, and the fulfillment thereof. They too today are still as much or probably more excited about the second coming of Christ than we are. Yes, we get excited about it. But we're not there in the presence of God where these prayers are coming up continuously and they're just like, come on, let's do something. Let's do it. Come on, let's go, God. Let's. I am sure the angels are pressing into that because in, in one of Paul's writing it says that the angels, uh, uh, they, they, they expectantly look into the things of salvation. I'm not exactly sure what's worded there, but it gives enough indication that the angels are very aware of what's happening in our lives, the lives of the believer, the situations around us, and they are so eager, both at the bidding of the Lord and the intercessory prayers that we pray. They just want to respond. And so when God says go, they go. So when, when Jesus was born and God sent out, first of all, the angel Gabriel by himself to go tell the shepherds, and then the whole host of angels, I believe that the doors of heaven were opened up and all of the angels came out with great passion and excitement because that thing which they had been longing for for 4,000 years and that thing which they had heard the saints cry out for 4,000 years was finally fulfilled and ready to be announced. And they came with, I would have loved to hear that song. It had to be fabulous. I will someday. One like it. Now, um, a note about the shepherds here. We know these shepherds were believers. These men were not wicked, idolatrous vagabonds. They were simple, humble shepherds who were a part of the remnant, the remaining group of people that had hung on to the promises and the prophecies of God and believed there was going to be a deliverer. The reason I know they were believers is because when the word was given, they instantly received it. And it came to pass, verse 15, when the angels were going away from them, from the shepherds into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's go see this thing which the Lord hath made done to us. And then the next five words, and they came with haste. No, absolutely not. I believe they went tearing across the hills over toward Bethlehem. I believe there was such excitement and passion, they left their sheep out there for the wolves. They didn't care about their sheep at that point. I imagine probably a couple of angels stayed there to keep the wolves out. <laughs> but they went with great excitement because they believed the word that was given. And they, they went in and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And they went in and talked, made known to them all that they had seen. Then they went from there and went out into the towns of Bethlehem as it was dawning. And told everyone, made known abroad, all over, the saying which was told them. Concerning the child. <laughs> and all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the angels. But Mary just kept these things and pondered them in her heart. And the angels returned back to the sheep, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard as it was told unto them. They just simply believed. But not all the people that they talked to believed it. So then next is the Mary and Joseph bring Jesus into the temple and Simeon, the prophet there, was promised by God that he would not die till he saw the Redeemer, and he saw as soon as he laid his eyes on him. There again, he, he didn't give up. He didn't stay home. He kept doing his work. He kept going into the temple daily. And it, and it says, I'm not sure if it says it in here. No, it just says that he would not die till he sees it. Sees the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, so the Holy Spirit began drawing him. First of all, he had a prophecy. You will not die till you see the Anointed One, Lord, the Lord's Christ. And so as the fulfillment of time came, he was led by the Spirit into the temple. 
And when the parents brought in the child Jesus, he took him up in his arms. He just laid, there he is. There's the child. The Lord spoke to him. Folks, it's the same way for us. We have promises and we have prophecies. Heed the Spirit of God. Because when you heed the Spirit of God and begin to walk, you'll just, oh, there it is. There's the promise. And he took the child and just prophesied very much. There was a woman in there. She prophesied. She was a believer. Then there were wise men, people from far off. And no one knows exactly who these people were. But I know for a fact, according to Scripture, that they were believers. And they studied the Scriptures. And they understood where and even when this time of prophecy was going to be fulfilled. And they were interested in it. Now, with a little bit of study, it's very likely, because of where they came from, that these wise men were descendants of the wise men that walked alongside Daniel during his captivity in Babylon. Very likely. Because of geographically where they came from. And someone sometime before this had to take the message and prophecies that were given to Israel into the land of Babylon. And we know Daniel did. When Daniel was there, he talked freely about God and the things of God. As a matter of fact, in Daniel's old age... Uh, when, when he was, after he was delivered from the lion's den, the king went out in public and made a decree that this God is a God to be worshipped and reverenced. And so we believe, I believe that these wise men who came seeking Jesus were descendants of wise men that walked alongside Daniel, taught by Daniel, who had embraced the prophecies and the promises of God. Because when they saw the signs and the unfolding of the times and the events, they believed and they went seeking him. And because of what they understood about kings, they went to a royal place to find him. To the big city Jerusalem, to the king. Um, where's this baby, king of the Jews? Where's this one that was born? Matthew 2, verse 2. Where is he that was born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east. And we came here to worship him. And when Herod the king had heard these sayings, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Why was Herod so upset? Someone give your opinions. Go ahead. Okay. So what? He was threatened. He was the king of the earth over that time. He didn't want someone to take his rule and reign. You're right. There can only be one king. Can only be one king. Wait a minute, Herod. You are 40-some, maybe 50-some years old. This is a baby. What do you care? Come on. He cared, that, he cared about his lineage. Exactly. However, this king Herod was not a Jew. He was not an Israelite. He was an Edomite. An Edomite are the descendants of Esau. Jacob, Esau. What were the prophecies given about Jacob and Esau? They would continuously be fighting against each other. And so the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, grew from the point of them when they separated them. And Jacob and Esau had separated there after they made peace years after he had deceived him. The, they grew, and the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, fought against the children of Israel terribly. Caused them much pain and affliction for many years. Many, many years. And they even helped Nebuchadnezzar come and destroy Jerusalem. They were allies and they even helped him. Come on, this is your brother. But no, there was such a hate against them too. Later, these Edomites were, were conquered by the nation or the people called the Maccabees. I think that's the way you pronounce it. And they were more of a, uh, I'm going to call them more of a peace-loving people. They weren't out to hate people. And they were, they were, they embraced Judaism and they acknowledged the Jews for who they were. And so when these Edomites were conquered by the Maccabees, they were obligated and forced to convert to Judaism. Practice the Jewish laws. 
practice those things. And they came into the Jewish um, assemblies through the rituals that pagans or outsiders had to become Jews. And so many of them were not adherent or they weren't at all in it with by their heart. The Maccabees were, but these, these uh, Edomites were not. That is who Herod was. He was of those people. And so there was an inborn hatred in him. And the Jews hated him. Hated him as a king. The way he got into that place of being a king is he was actually also a Roman soldier. Growing up, that's what he was. He was, because of the Maccabees and under what, what rule they were, he was under the rule of, of the Roman leadership. And he, was, he dedicated himself to it, became a soldier, and rose up through the ranks as a soldier, from captain to, to all the way up to being a ruler in Jerusalem. And they, the city of Rome, set him up there. And he saw it from his perspective as a time and place position where he's going to take the rule and reign of Jerusalem back to his people, Esau. That's what he saw. And you can see the devil in behind all of it. And that's why he had such a passion about, whoa, wait. Because he did not belong on that throne. He was not in the lineage that this throne was given to. And he had a reason in his soul to rebel against this king. That's why he went out with such a passion to kill Jesus. Well, not only that, but look what he did next. As soon as he got, he, he got, he was troubled when he heard these things, and he demanded of the chief priests and the scribes who this child is. So he knew where to go. He went right back to the scriptures. And so you're right. He knew. First of all, he knew he don't belong on that throne. He was trying to wrench it out of that lineage and take it into his own lineage. And then he also knew that the answers were in scripture, but he didn't know what they were or where they were because he, he didn't know scripture. Like the believers did, the ones that believed. They, as the things started happening, they were like, yeah, there it is, there it is. This guy didn't. He's like, this is probably true, but whoa, where is it? And they studied it, and they said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, but out of thee shall come a governor, and shall rule my people Israel. And so he acted real nice about this and said, oh, great. Um, yeah, go find him, and when you find him, come back and let me know, too. So we know the story there. Jesus was protected by a dream being given to them, and he was safely escaped to the land of Egypt, was called back later. And so what I get out of, I, I get so excited about this message because, yes, it pertains to what happened then, but it pertains to us in real life too. Because we have prophecies that we hold dear about our own lives and about the second coming of Christ the establishment of the eternal kingdom. And, and we don't know them clearly in our minds, but we, if we follow the scriptures and are attentive to what's happening in the time around us, the Holy Spirit will speak to us and guide us. So I would encourage you, children, everyone, do not take the songs away in a manger joy to the world. Hark the herald angels sing. Don't take any of those songs lightly. Don't allow them to become, oh, it's Christmas, here we go again, songs like this. No, don't allow that. But actually, embrace those songs. Embrace the message behind it and sing them with passion. Ask God to let passion wake up inside of you when you sing those songs. And don't ever get involved in the argument that Christ wasn't born this time of the year. So what? Don't get into that argument. Don't ever let anyone tell you that Christmas is just a pagan holiday and it's, it's this, it's that, it's wicked. Don't, don't ever let anyone persuade you to do that. Walk in the spirit of God. Walk in the spirit of prophecy. Walk in the spirit of the words of those songs. And look at it this way. To me, it doesn't matter if Christ was born in December or March or June. It doesn't matter. 
What matters to me, it is a time when almost the whole world acknowledges Christ in at least some form. It's awesome. It is a time when if you, it is, it is a time of the year, if you allow yourself, if you allow the anointing to come, you will feel completely different about Christmas than you did before and walk in that. And uh, there, years back when we got converted and started this spiritual journey, there was, there was this like, oh, you shouldn't celebrate Christmas and had all oh, the list of reasons as to why it's a pagan holiday and what the mistletoe means and the curse that it brings with it. And it goes on and on and on and on. Now, now don't get me wrong. There's some stuff that's pagan that you want to be careful with and you don't really want to get involved in it. But there was a young man that was really, really struggling so much that he did not even want to go home to his parents to the Christmas dinner. Because he said, it's just not right that we celebrate Christmas like this. And Christmas wasn't this time of the year. and It's a pagan holiday. And, and, and he literally showed up at my place the day after Christmas. Grumbling about all this and worried about how he's going to go home and, and, and eat this Christmas meal with his parents and not have a guilty conscience. But what I had been praying for the week before Christmas was, Lord God, I am open since Send someone to me or send me to someone where I can share with them the true message of Christmas. And that's the only person that showed up. He was, he was all indoctrinated with this, don't celebrate Christmas because it's pagan. And I just sat down and poured out my heart like this, about the passions of Christmas, about the message of deliverance, about the, the excitement of the angels announcing this and the long-awaited-for event. Radically changed him as far as I believe. So when I, when I, when we hear this, go with the spirit of Christmas, pick up the spirit of Christmas, I say yes in holiness and righteousness, not in, not in uh, careless and reckless spending and eating and drinking and carrying on. No, not that way. But getting into the spiritual things of Christ and just let yourself rejoice. Yes, there, Christ was born. It, it's, it's a, it, yes, it's a baby. He's not there anymore. He, we, we know the rest of the story. He didn't stay there. He grew and he came and he learned the things of God. And he went the whole way to the cross of Jesus Christ. There is where the victory was finally won. He was going to win that. No devil was going to stop him. He was warned by an angel in a dream. He was protected this way and protected that way. No one was going to stop that. But it wasn't actually fulfilled until he came up out of that grave and victoriously broke into eternity. That's where the final victory was won. That is the true message of Christmas. Yes, it starts down here, but it leads up to that. And that is why I also get excited about Christmas. If Christ hadn't come and been born in such a spectacular, marvelous way, I mean, what could be more nice? I mean, what, what could be more exciting? If it had just been ushered in as an ordinary king and rose up as a king in the palace and then revolted against the then established, that would be a messy story. This one is beautiful. It's, it's unstoppable. God bless you.